All right, well, I'll go ahead and start the recording. So you don't have a resume for Doug, we're just going to turn him loose. Call him out. Yeah. You know, I forgot that. You forgot. Well, that we've known him for so long, but probably not everyone knows. But he, he said he's ready to give his resume. Yeah. Okay, so you, uh, just up and down arrows, sir. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, so is it time to get started? No, we got a few minutes. Just a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. The gentleman can come to the table. Morning. Uh -huh. What's going on, Carl? You know, things are kicking in slowly. Yeah, slowly. I can remember when they were building that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a big deal at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> Pull up the chair. I need to get your. Uh, oh my golly! What are we got person here? And see that mud puddle so we can park there. Right. Is there a mud puddle up there? So, it's taken up about two or three spots. So yeah, there was a huge one last year. Yeah, pretty well dried up. I know was interested in rocks, but I have a mm, right feeling right. that might have come out <laughs> of not place. a rock. Is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. After well, it's rock. calcium, but oh, is that right? yeah. probably uh, other carbon. Yeah, yeah. that wasn't even the worst. Yeah. yeah, little heat. Yeah, huh? that, yeah. Uh, that was quite a dark one. <laughs> She's doing all right. Back? Uh, no, she's down in Bellingham this week. Yeah. Oh, she's been back. Or... Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, she's been back and forth. Yeah, you can tell her the sun's out now. So. But I've been rubbing that in every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty su pretty sunrise this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get started. Well, we have with us today uh, Doug Smith. Doug is a uh, longtime Fairbanksian and uh, has, uh, on and off over the years, been uh, with uh, Pascal Davis. He's been uh, with them uh, as project manager on the University of Alaska coal powered uh, coal fired power plant um, recently. And uh, I don't have a resume for him, so he's just going to have to jump right in. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Yeah, um, as Jim said, I'm uh, the project manager with uh, with Haskell Davis. We're the uh, the construction manager and general contractor that uh, UAF selected to uh, do their uh, new combined heat and power plant replacement. And uh, with me here this morning is uh, Mike Ruckhouse. Mike's the university senior project manager and has been worrying about power problems on the campus for years, a really long time. So uh, today we're uh, going to give you a, um, an update on, on where the project's at and uh, how it's coming to completion. And uh, a lot of you have probably seen uh, Mike's presentation before. Some of these are um, poached out of uh, work that, that Mike's done. But the, the driving force for the project is that the, uh, the existing uh, heat and power plant on the campus had reached the end of its economic life. Um, the boilers there were erected in, in 1962, and uh, it's, it's just a machine. It has a finite life, and, and it was time to, uh, to get it replaced before they started having more serious problems. Um, the campus, of course, needs a, a really reliable energy solution. They have over 3 million square feet of uh, facilities to, to heat and power. Um, and you probably all heard Brian Rogers say at one time, we can't be left cold and in the dark. So uh, that, that brings up the question of how did the university uh, elect to put in another coal boiler? And that again was, uh, was economically driven. It was the, uh, the best solution available. And you can see the the cost differential for using the next best alternative fuel is is pretty significant. Um, they did look at uh, at several different scenarios that convert it to oil and to natural gas. Um, as the 
IGU is narrowing in on on its goal of um, making gas more widely available here at the prices they're aiming for. It's still a almost $10 million cost differential per year for it to fuel the plant. So when they uh, selected this coal boiler, then they looked for the, the best available technologies and they found one that drives down most of the key performance indicators on the boiler. Uh, this new boiler produces uh, substantially less of all the criteria pollutants. Um, the one, one item that's really of note in this is that uh, that uh, particulates one in there where it's driving it down. The boiler manufacturer uh, says that this is the, the lowest particulate emitter that they've ever designed or built. And that's significant for here. That The PM is something we've been trying to control in the, the Fairbanks airshed for quite some time. Okay, um, then the, um, the university selected a, uh, a construction manager at risk project delivery method. And what that means is they solicited uh, firms like mine that uh, participate in uh, design and construction of projects. And in doing so, uh, we provide them a, a guaranteed maximum price and uh, some of the, the gain sharing available with the owner that helps keep their costs down. It gives them uh, certainty to get the, the project financed. And probably the biggest thing that it does is it promotes a, uh, a really healthy cooperation between all the parties. Um, everyone's uh, cards are essentially on the table. And what the other party's goals are and what uh, and how to achieve that. And that that part worked really well. And if somebody would cover Mike's ears for a minute, I, I want to tell you about the university and I, I don't want him to know because it weakens my negotiating position. <laughs> but the, the university has a, a very small uh, staff to um, manage and coordinate these projects, but, but they were really effective with us. Um, the, the key thing that they did is they, they had the vision of what the project was going to be. And they knew what they wanted all the way through and were constantly steering it in that direction. And that, that really makes it a lot easier to do an engineered project than when the person you're building it for knows what they want the end product to be. And this delivery is good on that. And it, it worked very well. I was just going to add that probably the best example of that is when early in the project we came up uh, about $50 million over budget. And uh, came, to the, came to the table with the parties and say, we got to do something. And, you know, the history in power projects is something like that could be a two-year delay, two or three-year delay. Sometimes it sinks projects. Four months later, with Haskell Davis, the engineer, the vendors at the table, we retooled it, we rewrote uh, four contracts, and we were going four months later after we got the bad news. And it was uh, just just the team and actual rela relationships get down, and everybody wants to see it succeed that we. Yeah, so when when any, any of you have capital projects coming up, it would be, you could get some good lessons learned from the, the university on how to employ that construction manager at risk GMB method. Okay, um, the company that's executing this is a, a joint venture of Haskell Corporation and uh, Davis Constructors. Uh, Haskell's a um, 128 year old company headquartered in Washington State and has been uh, working in Alaska since uh, the 1940s. And uh, their primary lines of business are power generation, and um, oil and gas production. Then uh, Davis Constructors has uh, been working since the 1970s. They're uh, one of the state's premier building contractors. Um, they have experience with a lot of complex projects like the uh, remodeling the, the Providence Hospital while it was still in operation and putting up the, uh, the engineering building there on campus. And Davis also brought uh, recent experience with the construction manager at risk process, which uh, helped us integrate into it very well. So the, uh, the decision to become a, a joint venture of those two companies 
um, was was a business decision that was driven by our bonding capacity. Um, Haskell probably could have uh, provided the, the bonding necessary for the $245 million project on its own, but that's about our whole capacity, and that, that's putting all our eggs in one basket for several years. So by sharing that uh, risk with Davis, was, uh, we're both able to maintain our, our other business lines and fully concentrate on delivering this project. So uh, as Mike mentioned, we had uh, had some challenges getting the, um, the project going. Uh, it had a, a fixed funding level, and um, everyone at the university was, was very sure from the start that there was going to be little to no opportunity to, to go back and get additional funding for it. So we had to make the, uh, the scope of the project and the execution of the project fit the available funds. And uh, yeah, Mike just told you about that effort we went through. When uh, the original concept for this had uh, more redundant equipment in it than what the, the final uh, project does, but uh, we were able to deliver something that still met all the, the performance criteria and um, get it to fit the budget also. Um, some of the construction challenges we had, there was a significant effort for improving the soil there. The, um, the new power plant goes right out in front of the old one and it's old riverbed material in there. And to meet the, uh, the seismic requirements for it, there was uh, a significant <coughs> effort done with this uh, deep vibratory compaction and the construction of uh, underground stone columns to rest the foundation for the plant on. And uh, I'll get some photos a little later on here to show you how that worked. Uh, after that, um, fibro compaction was done. That left the, the soil very, very dense. And then we had to turn around and drive piles through it to support the, uh, the steam turbine. And that was one of those efforts that took a lot longer than, than anyone had anticipated. Um, then uh, we had a couple situations with the boiler manufacturer. They had uh, had the steel for the boiler supports and all the boiler components um, manufactured and fabricated overseas. And um, they sprung on us kind of at the last minute that they weren't going to make the, the delivery dates that everything was predicated on. So uh, instead of getting steel in, in June, we started getting it in September. So we, we came up with a plan to overcome that and keep as close to our schedule as we could. And there was, uh, we worked a lot of uh, overtime. We worked through the winter when we wouldn't normally be doing outdoor activities like steel erection. And we worked a lot of things out of sequence. And then the, the other big challenge on this was all the, the interface engineering. Um, the university had issued a purchase order for the uh, design and supply of the boiler for the design and supply of the steam turbine generator and for the uh, air-cooled condenser. And so they had those three little silos mainly concentrating on, on their scope of work. Um, the university also contracted with uh, Stanley Consultants to provide the overarching design. And then there were several other vendors that had uh, design built or design and supply contracts like the, uh, the fuel handling, the, the coal offloading uh, portion of the plant that needed to tie into that and getting all those different groups together to deliver a, a design that, that would actually function the way it was intended was, was one of our big challenges. So what, uh, on uh, schedule, we're, we got started in, uh, in 2015 with the, uh, the site preparation. And at that same time, the <laughs> were uh, all the, uh, the civil and structural portions of the job. In 2016, we started uh, placing the foundations, pouring concrete, um, that started on uh, steel erection and got the uh, steam turbine delivered and installed. In 2017, we uh, completed the, the boiler erection and, and most of the balance of plant uh, <laughs> Facilities. Um, construction was complete in, in fall of 2018, and we're aiming for uh, what the power industry calls commercial operation for the university. It's, it's getting the, the keys to the plant to run as, as they need to, and we're aiming for that in May of this year. 
so the um, the work that's in it there were um, these uh, uh, six distinct buildings the uh, the boiler house itself that houses the the new boiler the bag house which is the main uh, air quality control system uh, for this plant the uh, steam turbine generator building the building that you can see most easily from Alumni Drive is the material handling and coal offloading building. Uh, there's a ash handling building on the south side of the plant that's not as visible when you're driving through campus. And then one of the the most recognizable features on this is the, the utility bridge that connects the Atkinson building to the, the new plant. And there's uh, pipe and electrical services that run through there. And it also provides the, the plant employees uh, weather protected path to get between the two buildings. So with the, uh, the skin peeled back off the building, this is what it looks like. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing the, uh, the steam turbine generator building. And it's a, a three-story structure that um, houses um, a lot of electrical switch gear, uh, cooling water pumps. And then on the next floor, the, the steam turbine and generator itself and on the floor above that, the uh, control room that that the whole plant is operated from. In the background of that, the larger red square is the uh, air-cooled condenser, and that takes the the steam out of the, the back end of the turbine after it's exhausted its energy and converts it back into condensate for reuse and recycling back into steam. Then the center portion of the building in the, the foreground, that's the material handling and coal offloading area. And there's uh, rail tracks that run through that, follow the same path that the the previous ones did. And uh, coal is delivered by rail car and offloaded there. And from there, it's uh, conveyed up to a uh, a crusher where it's sized to the gradation that the the boiler wants to operate efficiently. And then uh, from there, it's delivered up to um, storage silos up towards the top of the building. Then in the, the background of that center section is the boiler itself. On the left-hand side, you can see the, uh, the coal storage silos. There's three of those that uh, all feed the boiler simultaneously. And there's uh, when the boilers run at, at maximum rate, there's three days worth of coal storage in those. Then uh, just next to that is the boiler itself. The, uh, the furnace section of the boiler extends up almost 100 feet and then uh, on the, the back pass of the boiler, there's um, several efficiency devices added to it. There's, um, it takes the heat out of the flue gas and pre-warms the combustion air that goes in, takes the same heat out of the flue gas and heats up the, the boiler feed water. And um, then from there, the flue gases pass out to the, uh, the section of the plant on the right-hand side, and that's, that's the bag house, and it operates like a big vacuum cleaner that that collects most of the uh, particulates that would otherwise be discharged. And then the little orange part that you can see in the background of the bag house is the, the ash storage building. So the heart of this whole thing is this um, circulating fluidized bed boiler that uh, Babcock and Wilcox company designed and supplied. Um, Babcock and Wilcox is one of the, the world's oldest names in, uh, in boiler design. Uh, they've been in business since the, the early 1800s, and they've been one of the, the leaders in the development of this technology. Um, there's probably 70 similar um, circulating fluidized bed boilers in operation around the country, and, and they've delivered probably 300 of them around the world. Um, so the, uh, the technology that the university selected was was quite well proven. Um, this is one of the, the smaller boilers that BMW has constructed. Um, most most power boilers are are much larger than this, but this one's sized to match the the university's predicted demand for the the next 20 plus years. What um, what makes these boilers different than the ones that they're replacing is at the the bottom of this there's a a bed that's filled with with sand to get the operation started, and it's eventually replaced with uh, with ash out of the coal to maintain that level. And 
there's uh, a really large fan, a 650 horsepower fan that uh, provides bubbling air to that sand bed and it eventually begins to act like a fluid and then it gets lifted up the entire course of that furnace section, that uh, whole blue path you see inside there. And um, there, when the coal's injected into the boiler to be consumed, it gets burned in suspension all the way up and down that, um, that furnace section. And by burning it in suspension, it can be burned on all sides and gets nearly complete combustion out of it. And then the internal recirculation portion that they talk about in there is, uh, you see the section called uh, furnace U-beams. The ash and unburned coal contacts those U-beams and gets directed back down into the furnace to be consumed again. And it gets nearly complete combustion out of the coal in that manner. So um, in that building, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff. The footprint on the ground of it is only 35,000 square feet, but there's a whole lot of things in that 35,000 square feet. There's over 7,000 yards of, of concrete, uh, about a million pounds of reinforcing steel, uh, over 5, 000, 5 million pounds of structural steel, um, 22,000 feet of pipe greater than two inches, almost 16,000 feet of pipe less than two inch, uh, 800,000 feet of wiring cable. You look through the place, there's cable trays all over the place that are just packed with wire. Uh, there were over 17,000 uh, electrical and instrumentation terminations in there, and there's over 3,000 uh, instrument devices that uh, provide information on the plant and, and provide control to it. So there's a whole lot of stuff packed in a really small box. So we talked about what the, uh, the vibro uh, compaction looked like. And that uh, the head on the bottom of that shaft there vibrates at, at a real high frequency and then it has water jets attached to it that let it penetrate down into the ground to a depth of uh, 40 to 50 feet. And it creates a, um, first the vibrations densify the soil around it. And then as that probe is being retracted, it's filled back in with uh, the large rock you see in the foreground there, and it leaves a, a column of stone that provides a really high bearing capacity for that soil. And there were almost 900 of those um, probes dropped in to, to densify that site. How long did that take? Uh, that was that took the uh, three months of summer in 2015. Yeah, it was just over three months to get that done. The uh, the foundation that supports the boiler house, um, and the boiler house has nearly uh, four million pounds of, of load on it. Um, that one is uh, is a large foundation. It's uh, five feet thick. It's 85 feet wide and 115 feet long, and it consumes 18. That was all placed in a, a single pour, and we had. Every every batch plan in town supporting us on the data. And um, maybe it's a construction guide thing, but one of the things I find fascinating about this foundation is that if you measure the the neat line, just the volume of the forms on this, it comes up to be 2,200 cubic yards. But there's so much reinforcing steel in there that it displaced 400 yards of concrete. I was going to say that rebar is a good size rebar. Yeah, that's uh, that's number eleven rebar. It's inch and three eighths in diameter. Oh. And, uh, so yeah, go ahead and throw one of those on each shoulder and yeah. The the ash foundation um, supporting the uh, the ash storage silo that was a equally impressive foundation. That one's uh, over nine feet deep and uh, it. It required 2,200 yards of concrete, mm -hmm. and again, that was uh, an all-hands-on-deck from all the uh, concrete suppliers in town to keep up with that one. What year was this? This was done in 2016. Mm -hmm. We get some good work as we had a similar petition. LNG storage tank. Oh, yeah. Where they ate yeah. them up for a day or two. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, steam turbine generator sits on a foundation that's independent from the rest of the building, and it's 
underlain by uh, driven piles, and that that lets any vibrations from that machine get transmitted into the ground and not not create harmonics in the rest of the building. So that was uh, a complicated foundation to build. Then this is showing how we we got around some of the late steel deliveries. Uh, in the the foreground is the the bag house end of the building, and that's the steel <coughs> that we asked the boiler supplier for last. So naturally, it arrived first. Um, in the uh, in the uh, background of that is the steel, the steam turbine generator building, and then there's this 115 foot gap in the middle, waiting for the steel that supports the boiler. And so we we built some things out of sequence that um, caused a little little more work than it otherwise would have, but uh, but it kept us closer to our schedule. So the other things we did to uh, accelerate the schedule or uh, fabricate some pieces off-site. Um, one of the most notable features of that is this uh, this pipe bridge that connects the Atkinson building to the, the new power plant. It's real visible from uh, from Alumni Drive and stands out when you look at, uh, at photos of the plant. And that we had uh, fabricated off-site into sections that were all between 30 and 40 feet long, had the pipe and cable tray loaded in it. And then um, we did the, uh, the piles that support it ahead of time. And when these arrived, it took just six days to run that 440 feet of a building and tie it together. And so that, uh, that helped us maintain our schedule also. Where was it fabbed? Was it fabbed in Alaska? Uh, no, it was fabricated at um, Haskell's facility in Washington State. And then we did a, a lot of pre-assembly of components. Um, these are the, the bottom ends of the coal silos. And we they came to us as a do-it-yourself kit. We got these truckloads of, of steel that most of the time were marked with uh, part A and part B go together. Um, sometimes they weren't. But uh, these we, we fabricated into as large a sections as we could move um, in one of the yards on the university property and then uh, roll them into place to shorten the assembly time inside the building. And then we did a lot of winter work and that uh, that involves weather protection and diesel heaters and and uh, a lot of really tough iron workers willing to be out in minus 20 weather still stitching steel together. And that, work we hadn't uh, originally envisioned when we got the job started, but it was what was needed to keep the schedule going. How did it impact costs? Um, it, it did. Um, we kind of use a rule of thumb for um, the amount of efficiency and productivity loss. You, lo you lose um, about 1% of productivity for each degree below 30 degrees. So mm -hmm. when we're working at 30 below, it's a pretty substantial impact productivity, but we were still getting schedule. Yeah. There's uh, a lot of substantial rigging that goes on in a building like this to get all the heavy components in place. Um, this is hoisting the, uh, the steam drum and mud drum, the main components in the boiler, up into their final position at the top of the building. And um, one of the cost saving measures that we came up with, instead of mobilizing a crane large enough to uh, to pick up these um, 120 tons worth of material that's dead center in the building and would require a huge crane boom to reach out and over to them. We, uh, we rented strand jacks, which are, uh, they take a bundle of cables and just pull them through inches at a time to, uh, to hoist loads like this. And that was substantially less cost to mobilize than a, a large crane. Right? Then uh, if you get a chance to look at the building, you'll see miles and miles of piping in there. Um, there's a uh, steam pipe that runs around the building and, and all kinds of services that uh, support that. So in, uh, in March, we got to the, uh, the top of the building. That's the, uh, the top of the, uh, 
the boiler house that the, the elevator shaft peaks out up there. And uh, got all the steel erected at that point. So after then, we were ready to start getting the building closed in and on with the rest of the work. So as we got there and um, got the uh, boiler assembled, um, there's a stamp that goes on it that indicates it's uh, it's done in accordance with the ASME code. As we we're putting that stamp on it, we we're wondering if this is the the last coal boiler that's ever going to be built in America. Um, Mike and and Choku Ward have made uh, a few presentations to uh, power generation groups um, throughout the years as this project was being uh, financed and proposed, and uh, it was back several years ago that that uh, some of those power generation groups started tagging this the last coal boiler to be built in America. So all that went together to make a, a building that looks like that. And uh, if I don't say so myself, it turned out to be a pretty nice looking structure. So it takes a lot of people to do um, a project like that. And uh, I won't read them all because there's over 300 there. But as you're uh, looking down that list, you see a lot of local Fairbanks companies and a lot of uh, Alaska companies that participated in this. So um, how did you find all those different people with all the specialties? <laughs> it's not so specific to, you know, Haskell Davis knows. All these various subs that can provide discrete components or services. Yep. That's that, that's the secret. That's why you have to hire us for your next part. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only the last. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last power plant? I I hope not. It may be the last coal-fired one for quite some time. But <laughs> um, no, um, some of that is uh, working with the. the the engineering design teams um, contact vendors for specialty equipment that, that they know about, and that, that gets brings people to our attention to, to work with. Um, a lot of the, the subcontractors that supply services, those are just developing relationships with those companies that where we, we learn somebody that we know can deliver a certain product that we need. And um, and uh, a lot of it is is really just grub work. It's going through uh, looking for companies that that provide those and, and pre-qualifying them to make sure they can deliver what you're looking for and, and that they have the, uh, the experience and track record to, to bring that to you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, as you're looking through that, a lot of local companies there, Patrick Mechanical, uh, Linden Transport, uh, Greer well, Tank, well, Hector's yeah. Industrial Insulation, a lot of people from right here in town, and the, uh, the list goes on. I, this is um, the 300 that I found in our purchase order and contract log, and there's there's others that offered more to us that uh, may have inadvertently be less be missed. But uh, yeah, it takes a a lot of people to uh, to do a project like that. So uh, now we're at the point in the project where we're uh, commissioning the new plant, and uh, that, that's uh, the process of checking the equipment out, making sure it's ready to operate, and and then uh, test running it. And we've had a few challenges in, uh, in this section of it. One of the challenges we identified really early on is that the schedule was driving us towards having to do the uh, the performance testing of the boiler, which means we're running out of at maximum rate and running the steam turbine at maximum rate in the season when UAF has its lowest power and heat demand. And um, the the utilities department and, and Mike came up with a, a plan that let us take care of the uh, the steam use there. They found places that they can uh, they can push the steam all around campus and it's it's a little risk on their part because while we're testing the new boiler and providing them with with large volumes of steam, they're having to turn their old ones way down, so there's not an immediate way to catch it if something goes wrong. Um, and then for the uh, electricity, we installed uh, load banks. Those are um, almost like a giant toaster. 
Um, the electricity gets put into those that are a big resistor that absorbs that electricity and dissipates it as heat. And the reason we selected those is that although the university does have a, a connection to the Golden Valley grid um, that's exporting that power from a plant that's still being tested is a, a risk for Golden Valley because if they're suddenly relying on 19 megawatts from, from this plant and something goes wrong, they need to be able to uh, immediately recover from that. So the cost of having them regulate that power uh, was going to be more than what the rental of the load banks was. So it it seemed uh, seemed like an odd decision to not have beneficial use for that power, but it it was the best decision for the project. Then uh, we had a, a little cascade of things as we were uh, getting ready to roll. One of the first things we encountered is that the uh, the coal crusher is uh, controlled by a variable frequency drive that that changes the speed of rotation on that. And um, we had we purchased that uh, from a, another company that packaged it together with the whole coal handling system, and they unfortunately selected the wrong size VFD for it, and it couldn't handle <coughs> the, the coal crushing at the rate that we needed. So um, we were able to work with uh, some electrical suppliers who, who got us the right size one in relatively short order and, and got past that and got to the point we were crushing coal. Then uh, shortly after that, we encountered a, a design flaw in the, in the boiler. Um, as explained in one of the previous slides, there's a, a big hopper at the bottom that contains sand and ash that makes the fluidized bed that the combustion takes place in. And this hopper had uh, kind of a compound failure in it, one that uh, in its design, it left out some fairly critical stiffeners in the, the steel to help it support its weight at the load points. And then the, uh, the fabricator that made it had substituted a lower grade steel and, and not notified anyone. So the, the two of those together resulted in a, a failure of the support beams for that hopper that took us a little while to, to get corrected. <clears throat> we got past that one and then we started uh, ramping the, the boiler up when we had a, a failure of one of the boiler feed water pumps. And um, this plant has two feed water pumps. The, the feed water pumps supply the, the water at the necessary pressure to the boiler to uh, keep it from, from overheating and to supply the right rate of water for steam production. And we have two of them so that if one does fail, the other one catches it right away. There's a, a third one installed in the plant that um, <coughs> Is there strictly for emergencies? If the plant were to lose electricity that drives these pumps, then a steam driven pump would kick on and allow the boiler to safely shut down. But uh, one of the electric pumps um, failed and we ended up having to send that back to the, the manufacturer and getting that uh, reworked and we've got it back in service now. Once we got past that one, then we started um, running the boiler at, at increasingly higher rates. And we had a, another electrical failure in the, uh, the transformer that runs the variable frequency drive that turns the 650 horsepower primary air fan. And that primary air fan is the thing that, that fluidizes the bed. So without it, the boiler just doesn't run. And um, it had a, uh, an unusual failure in it that um, Mike just went back to uh, the manufacturer's facility in New Jersey uh, a week ago, along with a, uh, a forensic engineer, examines transformer failures. And uh, we're awaiting the, the final reports from everyone, but it's pointing towards a, a manufacturing flaw in it. So uh, with, with some help from the, uh, the manufacturer and, and a lot of scrambling on university staff's part and, and our staffs, we were able to find a replacement VFD and get into, get it back into service within a couple of weeks and got past that one. And then uh, in the course of doing that, we encountered a failure with the uh, generator circuit breaker. It, uh, it wouldn't close and a, uh, an electrical generator isn't very much good to you if you can't connect it to anything and 
let power flow somewhere. So the, uh, the vendor on that was quite responsive, and it turned out to be a fairly minor item to fix, but we, we got past that. And then the uh, the next thing we encountered was um, in the uh, the sand and ash that make up the fluidized bed, there was some fusing and agglomeration that occurred there. And that's uh, some of the evidence of that is these things that are there. And I've got a photo I'll show you what it looked like. But the, uh, the fluidized bed became solid. And, and uh, there's no fluidizing action. The boiler doesn't, doesn't really perform. It sounds like almost volcanic. It, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, so that, that one's still under investigation and, and we're narrowing in on the root cause. We're not 100% sure yet. But after we got past that, we were ready to operate again. And then we had some, uh, some level controls fail. Uh, they failed in the device called the multi-clone dust collector. And that's, that's a piece of the back pass of the boiler that collects the particulates out of it and uh, loads them back into the, into the furnace bed where they can become part of the fluidizing action then. And without control of the levels on those, um, we're not able to operate the boiler successfully. So we're uh, in the process of getting those repaired right now. But here's some photos of what happened on the, uh, the bottom hopper, the support beams that, that hold that up uh, um, did uh, crumple and it turned out that the uh, the designers on it omitted some stiffeners that needed to be in place uh, right at that load point, and then uh, the substitution of lower grade material contributed to that. And so that uh, all the beams that failed on the bottom there were completely removed and and replaced with new ones. And uh, in talking about uh, local companies, I got to do a little flag waving for Hector's because we called them on Friday and told them about it. Uh, on Saturday, they had the material in their shop and were getting it uh, pre-primed. On Monday, they were cutting and welding to it. And on Friday, they had the replacement pieces to it. So just a week after we called them, they fabricated a, a new piece out of the proper material with all the right stiffeners in it. And we were able to get going again really quickly. So was that a design or was that a fabrication issue? I'm not it, it was a combination of them. So, yep. Yep. The, the design flaw was not having the stiffeners at the load points, and then the fabrication error was the substitution of the lower grade material. Okay. The um, failure that we had in the VFD transformer, that was uh, an, an odd one and not, not something that you know, we or the manufacturer had encountered before. But uh, from the investigation that was done on it, it appeared that, that uh, there's a red coated wire that goes down into that coil of the transformer. And it appears that it, it somehow uh, failed. It, it either uh, broke or fused or something, caused a short circuit within the, the transformer and uh, it blew itself out in that single phase. The, uh, the photo on the right is showing what the protective relays recorded at that time. Normally there's just a, a normal wave pattern that you see on <coughs> both sides of that event. And what uh, what happened at that point, there was initially a, um, a phase to ground short detected and then uh, that created a big plasma cloud inside the generator cabinet that initiated a phase to phase short and took out the rest of the transformer. Mm -hmm. And all that is, an event that happens within milliseconds. But um, we do have a, uh, we, we have a replacement VFD powering the fan right now. And uh, the manufacturer is sending us a replacement transformer to, to put in its place so we can put the original one back in service. Um, the boiler draws in uh, a lot of uh, outside air for combustion, and um, Babcock and Wilcox provided us this uh, combustion air preheat coil uh, by a manufacturer that they've used dozens of times. 
but somebody was having a bad day at that factory when they put that solder joint together because it it was leaking uh, pretty substantially. So we had to get that repaired. Then this is the uh, the fluidized bed agglomeration. You're looking in through the the bottom door of the furnace there, and in normal conditions that would be a flat level of uh, sand and ash. And it would it would just look perfectly flat. Um, what had happened was the the glassification of some of the material in there, and uh, it occurred after a period of time that we were running on the the natural gas burners for uh, a few days. So um, BNW and and the university and our staff are going through, still trying to, to figure this out. Uh, we've got the material sent off to a lab for analysis to see if we can figure out what had the, the low melting point that triggered some of this. And uh, then BNW is examining it to see what other instrumentation they could do that would give the boiler operator a clue that, that this is beginning to happen and he can take steps to prevent it from happening. What do you mean by limestone chemistry? Oh, um, one of the emission control um, methods that the boiler uses is that there's limestone injected with the coal as it's being combusted, and the uh, the limestone attracts the the sulfur and and other criteria pollutants to it, and uh, it gets collected in the ash, and that's able to be taken out in the bag house. Right. So, <coughs> is in the chemistry some. Um, Something in the type of limestone or the relative levels or yeah, um, I don't know. The, the boiler manufacturer had, had looked through the limestone that was available um, and it was not a point for point match on what they would normally look at, but they found that the absorption rate that it could offer um, was satisfactory, so they, they agreed to its use. And um, now we're looking at it in more detail to see if there's something in there that could have contributed to the using that we see there. This is our fox based limestone? Uh, yeah, this is from Great Climbing. Yes, yeah. so I thought you said earlier that the, the flame is supposed to be suspended above it in the air column. Oh, yes. So the, how do you get the heat down to the stairs and melt the fan? When the, uh, when the bed is laying flat there and the fans are running, um, there's, there's two startup burners above it that heat that sand bed and they heat it up to about a thousand degrees, the point that the coal will be getting combusting. And then once those, uh, once the bed reaches that thousand degrees, those are shut off and the coal's injected and that, that supports the combustion. And so we were running for a few days just on the, uh, the gas burners and uh, hadn't started injecting coal into it yet. And so that's one of the, the paths we're following down to see if there's something that needs to be Done differently with the uh, the fluidizing bed while the gas burners are in operation. Jackhammer it all out. It it broke fairly easily, and uh, we were able to break it into large chunks that would pass out through the door. So it's all cleaned out and back to the original startup. Yes. Line. Yeah. All the uh, all the solid material on there was broken up and, and carried out, and then the rest of the sand that hadn't fused was drained out through the bottom. And then replaced with new. Is there any moisture in that? Uh, no, no, because it's uh, subjected to between a thousand and sixteen hundred degrees. So it, uh, once you're in operation, it'd be the sort of thing that you don't turn it off at any more often than you have to. Exactly. It might literally run an entire year or whatever before you have a planned maintenance event in the, yes. of the summer. Yep. 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 So that's what we're looking into to see what what kind of instrumentation the boiler operator needs to get an indication that this could be occurring. Does it occur in other fluidized bed plants around the world routinely? You know, the, uh, the manufacturer told us in their sales material, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did they tell you? Yeah. <laughs> now, the, uh, the people that are operating the boiler have talked to folks they know that, that run similar plants in other places, and that they said they've had similar events occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it sand or just air sand? Or just what happened here was a, uh, it was a mixture of local sand from uh, 
that we had Fairbanks sand and gravel run through their dryer, and then it was about 50% uh, boiler ash. Because mm -hmm. you said you're trying to get to all ash. I mean, once you're rolling. Yeah, eventually the, you put the sand in there to start the process, and the sand slowly gets consumed and, and replaced with ash in the course of operation. We're, so you're still in the testing phase before you start this thing up. If yep. you had to guess, percentage-wise, how far are you through? <clears throat> um, I guess about 40%. We've we've done um, some of the contractual testing on the steam turbine generator. Um, the, the boiler, we, we haven't really started its performance test yet. And your goal is to be commercial in the six weeks or? Yes. Yep, yeah, like in, in mid May, we should be through all those steps. Transition and gearbox problems you mentioned. Between the turbine and the generator itself? Oh, there, um, during the initial startup of the steam turbine, there was, we were getting some unusual noise and readings in the, the speed reduction gearbox. The, the turbine spins at 6,600 RPM, the generator turns at 1,800, so it has a gearbox in the middle to reduce that speed. And we were hearing what we thought were unusual noises in it, so the, the turbine manufacturer sent uh, their team out to check it out and found it was all normal. Yeah, the clutch failed, but yeah. they replaced that. and. We put a slow start, BFD on the start, so it doesn't slam. There was a problem. Well, yeah. yeah, there's um, when the the turbine is is starting up and being shut back down. There's an electric motor that catches it and turns it so that uh, the the hot machine is not sitting there just suspended by two endpoints that can induce sag into its shaft. So this electric motor keeps it on turning gear and rotating at about 6 RPM. Yeah, and the clutch that engaged that electric motor did need repair. That's right. So then the, uh, the latest thing we're dealing with is this uh, level. In. This is an abbreviated photo of it. It's, it's a device that's about two feet long and has a, a radio frequency antenna at the end of it that uh, measures the, the density of the material that's sitting in, and from that it determines the level of ash in these MDC hoppers. And uh, we sent these off to the, the manufacturer to get them to evaluate them, and we're, the things that have come to mind for us right now are that there's either a, a defect in these, and uh, or uh, the weather manufacturer picked the, the wrong device for the application. And that, that one we're not sure of yet. So now that I've told you about everything that's gone wrong, we've had some things go really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, We did get the, uh, the boiler to fire on coal for the first time uh, in December. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it, it was um, a lot of steps to get there, but it, it went well once we did get it on. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, just a few weeks ago, we were able to get the plant up to 100% uh, capacity. The boiler is rated to uh, produce 240,000 pounds of steam per hour. And so the, the number up on the top right there, that shows the total steam flow coming out of the boiler. And, and we were able to, to get it to that 240 kPPH level. And then uh, down in the lower left corner of the screen, that, uh, that shows the amount of electricity that the steam turbine generator is producing. It's rated to produce 19 megawatts, and, and we were able to get it there. So that part, when the, when the plant runs, it runs very well. <laughs> we're, we're quite happy about that. Um, one of the things you're hoping to have run well is environmental you know, results. Do you have enough time to be able to at least uh, evaluate that too? Yes, uh, you can see a little bit of that in this same screen, right below where I have the yellow circle on the Top right there, mm -hmm. uh, it shows the criteria pollutants uh, that the uh, emissions okay. monitor is following, and uh, we were in in range of uh, everything that was expected there at that time. Cool. 
when the uh, <laughs> folks that run the Atkinson plant today walk through the new facility, they can almost immediately recognize and, and know how to run most of the auxiliary equipment that's in there. Yeah, they just need the specifics on how this particular control system works. And one of the things that, uh, that this project did in conjunction with Atkinson is provide the identical control system for the Atkinson facilities. So um, as they get used to that, they'll know how this one operates. And um, that, that allowed the university to get a lot of redundancy in the ability to control the plant. Um, so all the functions of this plant can be controlled from the Atkinson building. And likewise, this plant can control all the functions of Atkinson. What's the turn down on this thing? Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about it. summertime heat, which is nearly zero. Yep. Concerning. Um, we yeah. have electrical loads for all the lights and things that are down the building. So how are you going to handle that? The, the heat load in summer gets converted into running chillers to provide air conditioning. That stays similar to some fall and winter months. Um, the, the boiler was advertised to be able to turn down to 30 percent. Uh, we've actually demonstrated it down to 15 percent. Mm. We probably won't be able to make emissions at 15 percent, but yeah. 30 percent. So that's where we're at. No, you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the obvious. Yeah, I'm not very yeah, the, the obvious question is, gee, how did you do? Which you discussed to a degree on making cost, time, etc., and interestingly, safety. Our um, our safety performance was was quite good during the uh, the course of almost uh, 800,000 man hours of construction. We we had uh, three recordable incidents. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's above the national OSHA average, and uh, we were we were really pleased to have that um, go that way. Uh, Cost-wise, we're we are scraping hard, but we are still fitting the the university's budget, um, and that's the contractual relationship we have with them um, allows us to respond to their their needs and the the budget needs pretty well. So yeah, right now we're. We're looking at, uh, at finishing within the, the limits that they have. And time, too, I think. Um, yeah, our um, our contract was uh, designated to be complete in October of 2018. Uh, with uh, some of the delays that occurred, um, we've extended the schedule out now to, to June of 2019. But I mean, one thing to note, I mean, we're, Doug and I beat each other up. Uh, daily for some of these problems, and it's really frustrating for us. But if you look nationwide at power projects, a 10% overrun on a power project is considered a resounding success. 30% overruns on power projects is people don't like them, but it's just par for the course. And for us to have a budget that we established in, in basically 2011, we started. 2012, we established the budget, and we're still under that budget. And so, yeah, it's really a testament. That, I mean, Half of Davis is a huge part of sustaining the exactly. city to, to get there, and and, uh, and some of our other vendors have, you know, they've been equally as, as helpful. I think. So it's, and, it's, and it's kind of cool. You can see the finish line from here. I mean, commissioning yeah. wise, it wasn't a free ride. Yeah, well, yeah, but. We've looked at the preliminary data. The, the boiler vendor really feels good about where we're at. They don't see that there's major challenges in tuning. Mm -hmm. Our major challenges is just to get the reliability so we can run for yeah. three weeks straight without yeah. a little problem. Steve? Yeah. Um, hats off on the project management here. So here's a kind of a, a thought process. What do you think the cost would be or the schedule would be if you hadn't had that kind of team collaboration. Mm -hmm. I want to come up with that number because that was that's what the value you just brought to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, I know for my company's part, we would have if if we were doing this just on conventional fixed price terms, we'd have uh, substantially more contingency assigned to it. As it was, the 
under these terms, we're able to jointly manage the contingency. And uh, yeah, I would. I, I guess I would have to think it's probably in the 20% range that the project would have cost additionally and under different contract terms. Um, I, I do remember after we selected Haskell Davis, one of the other proposers, a well-established power contractor, who, they weren't used to the you know, contract manager risen process. They were EPC type contractor. They they were the debrief started polite, but then the VP sort of lost it and he just ranted. He told said the university is absolutely stupid if we select anybody except them. This company Haskell Davis doesn't know what they're doing. And, he, and their their bid was like thirty. You know, it would have been thirty, forty million dollars more. And uh, they they just said we didn't know what they're doing. Hassel Davis didn't know what they're doing. Only and you know, the project was destined for failure. Wouldn't they have been fun to work with? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a huge success story, not just that you guys are bringing this in with what essentially is not a cost overrun, yeah. but you scaled it down at the beginning. Um, and it's a power plan on a university in this time in our lives. It's just, it's a, and it's going to benefit the students and the budgets through cleaner and more cost effective power. And this, all, and this protects our billion dollar university. Yeah. Is, yeah that's so that's uh, we need to trump at this. For me? That and the Calvary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carl. Hey, um, so Mike and, and Doug, so in um, redoing the plan from the original plan, what was lost from the original plan uh, by downsizing? Probably the most significant thing is originally we were aiming for two smaller capacity boilers that would uh, allow them to run one at its best efficiency point all the time for the next several years while demand increased. And uh, having the two boilers that doubles the amount of support equipment that goes with them. So that was a, a big cost driver there. So instead of two small boilers, we had one large one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Biggest change we had during the rescoping. So then the two small boilers, that was a, that was a, uh, a risk backup. So if one went down. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have the large boiler, but you still have the old oil farming boilers. Yep, that's back, mm -hmm. back up. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we immediately increased some of our operating costs during an overhaul. We'll shut it down once a year for one or two weeks, and we'll be running on oil. The previous one, we could have alternated overhauls and run on coal during overhauls. So. What was the final cost line? Two hundred and forty-eight million. One last comment. I think you're being too modest. If you had bid this thing as an EPC at a higher price, yeah. and I think you would have seen 30% as Mike mentioned earlier on top of that. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, you're looking at it with looking at what I did and what I brought to the table. Yeah. Look at go to the other and the beginning of the project and yeah. look at it from that direction. I think you're going to see a lot bigger number. Yeah, there's. Um, we were able to share some of the staff load with the, the university and um, use their personnel that were there providing quality assurance functions and they were able to help out the, the construction staff. So that helped us keep our staffing levels lower and our, our job overhead was lower than it otherwise might have been. Yeah, I have a question exactly on that. One of your early slides, I think it said that there was something in there or 40% that was work contributed or handled by the university staff, right? Oh. Um, so there was a special that uh, yeah, at the very beginning. I, yeah, I think you're referring to uh, in the terms of our contract as the construction manager. Yes, right. Self-performed. Yeah, and there I was referring to to Haskell Davis. I see. Okay. Yeah. There, there's some parts of their work that wasn't subcontracted. Yeah. That's the hard term for that. Okay, because that's substantial. Yeah. And that that really turned to be a cost savings for us. To have them, so instead of having multiple layers of markup, right coordination, right mm -hmm. in house under one one markup, one tier of markup. Regarding the old plant, so the old plant is still sitting there, and it will yep. two out of three still yep. operable. 
they'll be sitting there for many years. Yep. <laughs> right. I mean, what's, what exactly in there is going to remain of use? I mean, I just, again, I would assume the old boiler, um, is that just going to get surplused? Yep. There's four boilers in there. There's two coal and two oil. So two coal boilers are going to be abandoned in place. And the, the oil boilers will remain as backup for this facility. That's what you mentioned as far as turbine. The backup for the existing steam turbine there will remain as backup. It's still serviceable. And uh, there's air compressor, water treatment, condensate. That's most place on con all condensate from buildings comes in there. So there, there's those functions that remain over there. And there are support functions, the offices. And uh, our large maintenance shop that's over there. There is maintenance space in the new plant. Their old shop with machinery and, and uh, is over at the old plant. Isn't uh, Brent Sheets? Isn't he going to? Isn't he planning on use some of those old coil facilities, coil facilities for his research that he's doing? Well, that's what they, I they have a gasifier project. Yeah. The mm -hmm. DOE that they're studying right yeah. now. It's it's just a study at this point in time. Should that go to construction? I, I'm not going to venture what the probability of it going to construction. Yeah, Should it be that it would include demolishing the two coal boilers and they put their gasifier facilities right in where those coal boilers are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did they actually have rent coming another couple of weeks. So then you don't have to build a building. You're ready to, eat, to get it demolished because you're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. And there's already coal handling facilities there to be a new project. So. No, there's not. Got three days no, they're just relying on the uh, on the coal silos. Now, what about before? Did you all have some self or some on-site storage? No, it's, it's always we, we, we've, we've been we've uh, been just in time delivery throughout the life of the project. Oh, well, I think. Maybe back in the 70s, they had a small coal pile somewhere. It's reported. I mean, Choke and I talked about it, and they're, they look at there's some property over. We had the oil backup. I mean, so with the oil backup, we we had in coal deliveries in the, you know 50 years. There's there was a flood on the railroad tracks, and they so we missed deliveries one day, and then they switched the trucks the next day. So it's it's not the way typically you'd run a coal plant, but it's worked. At this point. There is some risk there. I was just wondering, we know that out of the military bases, they keep a substantial stockpile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just couldn't remember from my time at the university ever seeing a, a mound. Well, you've got to handle it as well. Yeah. Okay. Hi, excuse me real quick. This is Robin Wood with the Daily News Miner for Bank's Daily News Miner. I just wanted to hopefully yep. get clarification on a couple couple points real quick. Um, so the contract that was designated to be complete in October 2018, that was the one with Haskell Davis, I'm assuming? Or? Yeah, that was December of 2018, and that, that was between Haskell Davis and the university, yes. Okay. And then um, the, the the cost that you're scraping hard to say within the university's budget, that was the $248 million. Yes. And uh, I think it was Mr. Ruckhouse the, that commented on the cost, the value of He didn't he didn't hear you. Yeah, say again, Mike. Hey, Robin, yeah. uh, we've got a clarification from Mr. Ruckhouse. Mm -hmm. So $248 million is the total project cost, not the value of Haskell Davis contract. Okay. But that, that's the, so what's the one that is, uh, that the comment was made uh, scraping to stay within the university's budget then? I was, I was speaking to the aggregate budget. 248. Yes. And was it Mr. Ruckhouse that commented on the, uh, how a 10% uh, time overrun on a project is considered a resounding success? I think it was budget. Yeah, cost overrun. Cost, over, cost overrun, okay. Uh, I think that was all I had. Thank you. Okay, well, let's get it ready. Thank you, Mike. And, and, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.